Good evening. I'm happy to open the events which we uh, at the center of the study for the study of Christianity uh, planned and executed in memory of uh, Hubert uh, Brennigmeier. And uh, tonight we have uh, a keynote uh, speech by Professor Jennifer Knust from Duke University. And tomorrow it'll be followed uh, by a colloquium, or actually a conference, on issues of marriage. That is from 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. So that's an early start. Uh, before we uh, arrive at Jennifer's talk, I would like to invite uh, Professor Menachem Ben Sasson, our Chancellor, our dear Chancellor uh, of the Hebrew U, to say a few words. Dear Aldegonde, dear guests, dear chair, dear keynote, welcome. You can be relaxed, there is no war. <laughs> Thanks for this conference. And maybe because of the elections, and maybe because of other reasons, but we are in a peaceful Jerusalem, and we study the basic of life, as always we do in the Center for Christianity, for the study of Christianity. It is a tradition. It is the 20th conference, public lecture and conference, back to back. Personally, I got the honor to speak once in these lectures, it happens that a permission is given to non-Christian st a scholar. By accident it happened. But to the serious point of view of this conference, and the mission, I think, of this conference that goes beyond the papers that are going to be presented. Because behind the center, there was a couple. And it goes back more than 40 years of friendship between our families and this family, Branit Meyer. It came maybe by sole accident, knowing my father-in-law, taking classes, personal, private classes with him, and it so happened that I served in the faculty and met with this couple. <coughs> and the output of this meeting was the making of the center, both at the end, in Rome and in Jerusalem. <laughs> so we are the parents of this kid in many ways, but the real parents were, will be, and are this couple, unique couple. And all along was the idea of dealing with two main topics. One was the topic of the family, and you know that Dick's weakness goes with Aldegonde for many years, research, sources, education, influence, and then creating new framework of dealing with it, with it. And the second issue is study of Christianity, but a serious study of Christianity. We should learn it by the language of origin. We should know it from the basics in order not to look down whenever somebody cites verses, sentences, ideas that taking the name of Christianity with authority of ignorance. And it happens in many places. People talk in the name of, as it happens in the name of many other religions. It happens because people take the authority not necessarily knowing the sources. And the idea, as I said, was let's deal with the topic with basic understanding of the languages, of the cultures, and with the mix or <coughs> meeting points between Christianity and other religious phenomena. And that's the secret of the success of this center. It deals with the basics. It learns the sources in the original languages. Whenever a scholar from the center here in Jerusalem or here in the other Jerusalem, Rome. <laughs> Kivitas Day or another Kivitas, it doesn't matter. We do not have to cite the verses. However, we should know that these people who go through these centers 
know from the sources what the Christianity says about X, Y, and Z. Z. And there is no one Christianity, as there is no one Judaism, as there is no one Islam. You have to know the sources in order to say that variegated sources take you to different roads. But it's better if you talk from the sources in order to deal with any topics it is that you deal with. So what is new? That's the cause, the basic of any university. I said nothing. The real life is beyond and behind topics like the one of this conference. This conference deals with marriage. But not only marriage, representation of marriage. You didn't go to representation and or in the title with the slash in order to escape. Because each and everybody who talks in this conference, and we know the scholars who talks in this who talk in this conference, each and everybody everybody who talks can talk about marriage and meet challenges of marriage in different modernities, in different realities. It could be the second century, it could be meeting with the challenges of the fifth century, and I even dare saying, because Aldegonde is here, she'll protect me of the 21st century. <laughs> Talking with her about challenges of Christianity, when meeting with the Pope, Aldegonde and myself, and few, ten other thousands, but we talked about it, and we talked about it with the Pope and with other authorities who know in order to meet with the challenges. Meet the challenge of family is not only taking it as a concept. Meet with the challenge of family is reading what Aldegondi and Hubert used to deal with for many, many years back. We do not have to solve these issues in the conference. We do not have to answer the concrete answers, but we should refer to them. And who, if not you, can talk about it? Who, if not us, can share with our opinion when it comes to op-eds in newspapers, when it comes to talks around table? In the conference, we have to have the borders in the focus of the, con of the conference. Out of the conference, in the breaks, after the conference, in many, many other opportunities. I'm speaking on behalf of myself, but in many ways, the Hebrew University saw its goal from day one, namely one hundred and a half year ago, sees its goal to be capable of dealing with sources and with reality. It's a place educates elite as a serving elite. And a serving elite should confront sources, questions, both in the, in the fields and periods of the, of the specification of every scholar's knowledge and at the, time, at the same time trying to express our expertise outside. Let's go back inside to the conference itself. You made your way abroad to hear serious lectures. You made your way from abroad and from many places in order to share with your knowledge. Use this opportunity. It's a marvelous opportunity to share with ideas of your fields of exp expertise, because the next time is another year. So why won't we pave the next option with the conference, the breaks, and the social meetings that we have around the conference? Good luck to us. All the best. Thank you very much, Professor Ben Sasson, for these kind and warm opening words. Dear Professor Menachem Ben Sasson, the Chancellor of the Hebrew University, 
Dear Monsignor Marcuso, the Vicarius of the Latin Patriarchate to the Holy Land, we are uh, delighted to have you with us today. Dear Mrs. Aldegonda Brennigmeier Ferhan, a friend and benefactor of the Center for the Study of Christianity at the Hebrew U. Dear members of the extended Brennigmeier Ferhan family and friends who came from different quarters in Europe to join us in celebrating dear Hubert's memory. Dearest scholars from Israel and abroad, speakers as well as chairpersons, some of them former uh, CSC, that's Center for Study of Christianity, I won't call it each time, it takes ages, <laughs> alike, who are participating in this CSC conference on marriage. Dearest students, actually the young, I would say cubs, if I may, of the center, representing its highly promising future Ladies and gentlemen, I feel very privileged and honored in the midst of this distinguished crowd awarded ex officio with the task of launching the 20th Brennigmeier Verhan Lecture and the Colloquium on Marriage and as Metaphor in Christian and Jewish Tradition, which is to follow tonight's keynote lecture. We are all gathered here as a one happy family to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Center's presence and vast ranging activity as an international beacon of excellence within the Faculty of Humanities of the Hebrew University. We are at the same time gathered here in deep sorrow and gratitude to join in remembering our devoted founding father and benefactor Hubert Benningmeyer who passed away about a year ago now, to whose memory the annual lecture and the ensuing conference are dedicated. Before I begin my short address, I wish to share the following with you. It was not easy to find info on Hubert Benigmeier, <laughs> which for me served as a token of his extreme, humble, and most pious presence, in sharp contrast to his deep involvement in charitable matters throughout his life, indeed a lesson to us all, present here, children of the mass media and networking systems. <laughs> Hubert Joseph Rudolf Brennigmeier was born in Berlin on the 19th of November 1934 into a deeply loving family with strong ties between the several siblings which, he, which left a profound mark on him. Following comprehensive education and training for which he was grateful all along his life, he joined the family business out of conviction and served it faithfully in a variety of locations in Europe. On July 21st, 1967, he married Aldegonde Paula Emma Maria Ferhan <laughs> from, <laughs> I'm quoting, I'm quoting, from Neuss, Udesheim, Germany. Hubert was a man of deep cultural interests, which, which very much occupied him beyond his busy professional life. His cultural preferences included music, literature, art, and history. Moreover, Rudolf, alongside Aldegonde, carried a profound religious conviction in the need to immerse themselves in activities within the church, which they both pursued actively for years. As a corollary of the above activity, to the above activity, they got deeply involved in interreligious dialogue. Their latter passionate interest in dialogue, coupled with their drive for philanthropic activity, induced them over 20 years ago to establish the Center for the Study of Christianity in the Hebrew University, a unique and thriving center in and of itself, and as far as I know, one of its kind in Israel. There are definitely by far more adequate people than me present here uh, uh, to dis today to are who are able to describe Hubert. I had the fortune to me meet him only once or twice uh, on his visits to Jerusalem, but these were fleeting encounters. I distinctly remember and cherish his si smile and warm words, which encapsulated his modest and, and accommodating personality. Sadly enough, come 2005, Hubert was confronted with several illnesses. He endured these hardships with great courage and resolve, relentlessly pursuing his vast 
commitments, among others, in the field of international bioethics group, alongside the development of a highly influential INTMAS, the International Academy for Marital Spirituality, which he founded with Aldegonde in Brussels, where he lived back in, still back in 1989. However, I believe, I would not be exaggerating, when I claim in the presence of this intimate family gathered here that he reserved a special soft spot uh, coupled with his deep commitment and high regard for interreligious enterprises. Both these traits manifested themselves <coughs> in the CSC in Jerusalem and its sister institution in Rome, the Cardinal Bear Center for Judaic Studies in the Pontifical Gregorian University, yet another unique center founded by him and Aldegonde in 2001. Sure enough, an exchange program for students as well as guest lecturers from both institutions was to follow and is now well established. I'm extremely happy to welcome here today my friend and academic counterpart from the Bear Center in Rome, Father Etienne Veto. What have Hubert and Aldegonde achieved with their pious and most generous commitment towards the center in Jerusalem? A few words on the center and its current admirable thriving status are in order. The center was founded in 2000 with the profound assistance of our current chancellor, Professor Ben Sasson, and under the guiding spirit and uh, leadership of our friend, colleague, and esteemed professor, a scholar, Professor Gdaliao Gistrumza. The center's activity being highlighted by the annual Benik Maifarhan lecture, which has since continuously brought leading scholars and church prelates to this very podium. Following Gies Tumza, who served for more than one term in, the office, in it, this office, was our dear friend and early Christianity scholar David Satran, who took upon himself to manage the center, which yeah. he did for several years, uh, uh, with great success advancing its activities. The center's presence and international esteem, however, really rocketed with my predecessor in office. Our dear friend and renowned scholar, Professor Buya Biton Ashkelon, is hand on the steering wheel. Under, the leader, under her leadership, the center initiated an international postdoctoral scheme carrying to our gates annually two young scholars from prestigious institutions with a wide array of interests. Along the years of, of its activity, the program proved to be a highly effective launching pad for these scholars, most of whom attained academic positions in leading institutions abroad. This scheme was facilitated by the generous support of Martin Benigmar, yet another member of this uh, uh, distinguished family, who was unfortunately unable to be present here today. Our warmest gratitude is hereby extended to him. Alongside the above, Buya initiated for the doctoral students who, had, who have perfected themselves in Christian studies a study group, better known as the The Forum. The only thing one mentions here, Forum, is Christians. <laughs> it meets every fortnight during the academic year for thematic discussions. The Forum has been active under the sophisticated guidance of our young colleague and friend and scholar, Dr. Jonathan Moss. This year, a second forum was established comprising of a younger study group. Thus, two highly active study groups of veterans and novices, consisting in total about 25 students, are currently operating under the auspices of the center. However, the good tidings from the center did not end with all the above. The center, with, under Burial Biton Ashkeloni, with friends organized two successive high-profile international conferences, a patristic conference in two, two, 2015, followed in, 12, in 2017 by the Origaniana Duo Decima, both attracting huge number of scholars. Finally, I wish on this occasion to acknowledge the devoted activity of a wide range of Hebrew University leading scholars who served from the, center, from the center's foundation on its academic committee, governing the center's <coughs> operations and offering their continuous effective counseling. Thus, 20 years following 
its inception, the C CSC has blossomed and its fame has reached universal acclaim. The time has come to, for us to set off on today's and tomorrow's Benik Meyer for Han annual lecture and its ensuing colloquium. I would like to thank those involved in the meticulous planning and execution of the upcoming events. <coughs> Allow me first and foremost to thank the driving force behind this, this event, that is my dearest friend and esteemed colleague, Professor Paula Fredrickson, uh, who has been a, a dear friend to the center and who together with me conceptualized the theme of the conference, its layout, and prospective topics and speakers. Thanks, Paula. Yet again, it was Bouya, as on other various occasions, who stepped in with effective advice and assistance, even last minute issues. Again, thank you, Bouya. My right hand man, whom without, without his calm and efficient work and resourceful thinking, this event which we are about to launch would not have taken place. My assistant, Daniel Shalem, is unfortunately unable to attend for very fortunate reasons. Unfortunately, for very fortunate reasons, his first baby boy was born just a few days ago. Mazal tov, congratulations, Daniel, and many thanks. Finally, I'd like to mention an important and highly efficient operative, bringing this event to its fruition conducting our overseas plans is Aldegonda's devoted assistant, Dominique van Helst. Thank you. Without further ado, the time has definitely come, you're probably sick and tired of my talking, to introduce our guest keynote speaker, Professor Jennifer Knust from Duke University, North Carolina. Jennifer Knust is a scholar of religion at Duke University who specializes in early Christian history author to, the name of a book, to cast the first stone, the transmission of a gospel story with Tommy Wasserman Princeton 2018, uprooted, unprotected, sorry, unprotected text, the Bible's surprising contradictions about sex and desire uh, from 2011, and abandoned to lust, sexual slander and ancient Christianity, Colombia, 2005. This is becoming promising. Wow. <laughs> she, <laughs> she studies early Christian texts, their contexts, and their receptions from multiple angles, with a particular focus on rhetoric and gender discourse. Her numerous articles, book chapters, and edited books address the materiality of texts, the intersection of Christian practices with other ancient religions and the ethics of interpretation in ancient as well as contemporary context. Please join me in welcoming Jenny Knuss. Um, I just want to say that I am so tremendously honored to be here. Um, it's very overwhelming, actually. <laughs> um, I'm really so thankful to you, Eldegunda, <laughs> so pleased to meet you in person and so happy to know a little bit about Hubert, if I may call him that, and so thankful for what you've built here, um, which is obviously a wonderful family of scholars and students and colleagues who care deeply about what they're studying and why. That is a rare and wonderful thing. Um, as I was listening to this really lovely introduction, I was just thinking about a saying that I love from Judith Butler's book, Precarious Life. She says, we're undone by each other, and if we're not, we're missing something. I feel a bit undone by this opportunity, <laughs> um, but I trust all of you to help me get through it. And I am very much looking forward to learning from everyone else over the next two days. In fact, I'm so glad I'm going first because that means I just get to have fun for the rest of the conference. <laughs> for a life to count as a good life, Sarah Ahmed points out, it must return the debt of its life by taking on the direction promised as a social good. A good life therefore charts a certain course, embraces some dreams as dreams come true, 
and proceeds along pathways recognizable as productive, responsible, and valuable, not only to the one who lives, but also to those observing that life. In the process, a life offers gestures of return to family, community, ancestor, and nation, knitting together a world where the good goes unnoticed as a social process at all. Marriage has been one of these social goods, a measure of personal and social happiness in both antiquity and today. In the middle America I knew growing up, for example, a young woman's wedding day was the happiest day of your life. And a little girl might grow up flipping through her parents' wedding album, cautiously peeping into the cedar chest that holds the satin wedding dress and dressing dolls in white. Though the circumstances were very different, Perhaps a Roman girl living in Egypt prepared for her future happiness in similar ways, anticipating the day when her father would sign a marriage contract on her behalf in the presence of seven male witnesses. We're just gonna live with the ghost in the machine and we're gonna decide it's okay. <laughs> and perhaps those who heard the Johannine story of the wedding at Cana thought not only of its spiritual implications, but also about the good wedding parties they had attended. Marriage is and has often been desire's social good, a way of expressing desire and offering a gesture of return that, at least ideally, satisfies everyone. The anti-marriage stance of many of the writings associated with the early Jesus movement therefore remains quite odd, expressive of an anti-world as well as an anti-desire standpoint that, if consistently practiced, was capable of bringing about the awaited eschaton, irrespective of divine involvement. The legacy of this stance, worked out and worked through by Jesus' followers and Christians into the present day, remains a hallmark of what being Christian came to mean and has meant, despite the vast array of responses to enigmatic sayings like, there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven, or in view of the impending crisis, it is well for you to remain as you are. As Paula Fredrickson reminds us in her recent study of the Apostle Paul, <coughs> monogamous marriages, sexual self-discipline within marriage, love of community, community self-governance, and support for the poor were ethics idealized by Jews about Jews and widely shared by pagans as well. Jesus' demand that his followers abandon property and kin in order to follow him, remembered by the gospel writers in sayings about the flood, and in the claim that at the resurrection there is no marriage at all, were both preserved and moderated in light of these shared values. The rejection of marriage as a personal and social good, it is a distraction, children are a burden, and the end is at hand. Troubled certain forms of desire, deni denied these desires a proper context, and yet was a basis for social and personal reimagining. If human marriage is not, always, often, ever, a social or personal good? What is it for? Later Christians responded to this question in various ways, with some reaffirming the value of disciplined sexual monogamy within marriage, others rejecting marriage altogether, but most looking for some kind of compromise that conceded the good of marriage and yet embraced perpetual virginity for those able to take on its more rigorous demands. As Elizabeth Clark argued 20 years ago in Reading Renunciation, over the course of the second to the fifth centuries, early Christian communities were increasingly stratified and hierarchalized by an axology, a theory of value, of difference, centered on ascetic renunciation. This axiology organized around an ascetic or householder binary, as opposed to, to offer a modern example, some theory of a hetero-homo divide, became the landscape upon which Christian cultures could be mapped and the Christian self could be drawn. Patristic critique of the heavy toll of fleshy marriage, its supposedly unique capacity for burdening bodies, souls, and lives with the constraints of material existence, invited speculation about other kinds of bodies and other sorts of lives, replacing one kind of future orientation with another. An eternal life in which the soul is united finally in an embrace with the divine, anticipated by a rigorous ascetic discipline, was the privileged course. 
Practice chastity between husband and wife was a secondary but possible option with equally significant theological implications. This way of configuring desire, defined here as the pursuit of some way forward, an orientation toward what one wants, and a way of reaching out for what is far or near, was about more than marriage per se. It was also about human-human intimacy and human-divine intimacy in a world of flesh. Stories about marriage, passages about weddings, and instructions regarding married life found in the sacred writings are central to Origen's presentation of the love affair between the soul and Christ. Christ wishes to espouse you also to himself, Origen promised in a homily to Rebecca at the well, for example. A soul which does all things patiently, which is so eager and undergirded with so much learning, which has been accustomed to draw streams of knowledge from its depths, can itself be united with Christ, he continued, so long as, like Rebecca, it draws from the water daily by visiting the Ecclesiae regularly, drinking water from the wells of scripture, and carrying home a vessel filled with the waters of spirit. Other readings of weddings, marriages, and bridal scenes make similar claims. In first principles, for example, Origen interprets the jars of water at the wedding of Cana as an indication that scriptures as a whole contains three levels of meaning, flesh, soul, and spirit. But some passages contain only two. That there were six jars is also significant. The number six may reasonably allude to those who are being purified in the world, he points out, since the world was made in six days, a perfect number. Similarly, a commandment about washing one's garment becomes in the homily on Exodus, a reminder that one should approach the wedding banquet of the soul in Christ in a holy and sanctified state. In Origen's writing, the facts about marriage, stories about marriage, and the presupposition that marriage is a desired outcome were refashioned such that the idea of marriage became instead a training ground for human divine intimacy. Human-human <coughs> intimacy, especially through sexual congress, was no longer a social good in quite the same way, despite a qualified acceptance of the good of bearing children. For the time being, however, other forms of human companionship remained essential. Visiting the well necessarily included attending the ecclesiae, where the logos could be encountered, and among the faithful, spiritual perfection could be sought, if not fully realized. As Origen explains near the close of his homily on Rebecca, Meditating on these words and perceiving the deeper sense and meaning, one will find a marriage worthy for God, for the soul is united with God. What are the social consequences of such an argument? Why and in what circumstances is such a desire recognizable as a good? Virginia Burris and Stephen Moore offer one answer. Reviewing late ancient Christian interpretations of the Song of Songs, they observe that allegorical exposition plunged interpreters like Origen into the arms of another love, that lover, God or Christ. By avoiding the female bride in their exegesis and reveling instead in a male-dominated and male-dominating erotics of deferral, the fathers, fathers reoriented and universalized their desires within a never-ending quest for fulfillment in the arms of a divine lover. Readers like Origen or Gregory of Nyssa never quite took on the role of the bride, however. The marriage was not consummated, at least not in this lifetime, and the practices of spiritual adornment were pursued instead. One social good of allegorical interpretation was therefore the establishment of male homosocial bonds at the expense of the bride, the woman, and the wife, the fleshly, not the spiritual kind who were positioned as foils to a delayed but ever anticipated spiritual achievement coded as male. Once fleshly women were out of the picture, the play of fantasy could begin. Origen's advice to actual wives in a homily on Lot's daughters make this dynamic clear. Concerned the hearers lured by a bare letter fleshly reading of Genesis will be appalled by the daughter's actions. He rebukes both the fleshly reading and their fleshly actions. Let the married women examine themselves and see if they approach their husbands for this reason alone, that they might receive children, and after conception desist. But some women, for we do not censure all equally, but there are some, who serve passion incessantly, like animals without any distinction, whom I would not even compare to the dumb beasts. In other words, Lot's daughters, recognizing in their father a manly soul, desired posterity, not pleasure, 
And so unlike their mother, a figure of concupiscence, they undertook only what was strictly necessary. An ad hominem attack against married women therefore provided an alibi for the action of Lot's comparatively chaste daughters. What they did pales in comparison to the, those passionate women who, like animals, pursue pleasure with their husbands at home. But the real lesson can be found in the spiritual, not fleshy fecundity. Origen concludes, if you wish to beget, beget in the spirit, since he who sows in the spirit of the spirit shall reap, shall reap life everlasting. Desire for human posterity may be acceptable, but desire for unity with Christ is more productive, aiming as it does for a restoration of a primordial dignity that has been lost. In the meantime, the social good of corporate worship and intense study of the scriptures provides the sustenance required for the long journey of the soul to its final fulfillment in the apokatastasis, the restoration of all to the good. Such a theology of marriage offered compensation to those whom, for whatever reason, resisted its charms. It also provided a warrant for a homosocial world in which wives, who by means of ascetic discipline and a martyr's commitment might also become men, by the way, were no longer necessary for the upbuilding of the assemblies, a striking contrast to other, more familiar civic ecclesiae. In Greek cities like Alexandria and Caesarea, where Origen lived, assemblies in their political guise were composed of male citizens, curioi, and by extension their households, their wife, their children, their slaves, whose interests the assemblies protected. Among these assemblies, social continuity was sought not in bonds of faith linking the brothers and sisters in Christ, but enduring relations of kinship, real or fictive, among the productive free citizens of the city. In such a context, actual marriage were essential to the good of the poli. At stake, then, was what social good actually is and what social good ought to be desired. As David Constant has pointed out, the Greek polis imagined itself as a collection of individual households, each presided over by a male head or kurios, and each related to others through ties of kinship and marriage. This perspective is reflected in inscriptions, funerary stella, surviving marriage contracts, philosophical, moralistic, and historical writings, and also in a set of lengthy fictive tales recounting the perils of a Greek hero and heroine who fall in love, face multiple dangers, and at the end unite in marriage. Known among contemporary scholars as the Greek romance novels, the popularity of these works of prose fiction was at a peak during Origen's lifetime. Indeed, the Christian apocryphal acts of the apostles, perhaps more to Origen's taste, though I'm not so sure, may have been composed in part as a direct counterpoint to them. These acts present literary inversions of the teleological plotting of the romance novels. Rather than concluding with the happy ending of marriage, as the novels do, the apocryphal acts recount the heroic and remarkably successful efforts of the apostles at promoting celibacy among the marriageable and married Greek men and women they encounter, especially the women. Their success leads local official, officials to persecute both the apostles and those who accept their teachings. From the perspective of the novels, however, marriage itself is the happy ending, an illustration of the positive results of proper paideia for the protagonists, a confirmation of the values of self-control, endurance, and fidelity, and a reaffirmation of civic responsibilities taken on by the urban elite. The dramatic ending of Caraton's Kereas and Kalirui offers one vivid example. Finally reunited, reunited after their adventures, the hero and the heroine return to Syracuse and are invited to go to the assembly, the ecclesia, to see what had happened. Those assembled cheer them on, listen attentively to Carius' oration, and accept his recommendation to grant citizenship to those who assisted him in rescuing Kaliroi. Meanwhile, Kaliroi went to Aphrodite's temple, placed her hands on the goddess's feet, placed her face on them, let down her hair, and kissed them. Thank you, Aphrodite, she said. Do not separate me from Carius again, I beg you. Grant us a happy life together, and let us die together. In Origen's homilies, the Christian ecclesiae are designed to foster bonds among the brothers and sisters in Christ as they regularly attend the festivals, listen to the words of scripture, and seek fulfillment in unity with the divine. 
In Caraton, Syracuse, the assembly decides who is worthy to join in citizenship, distributes prizes to those who provide benefactions, and offers praise and acclamation to whomever perseveres in the upbuilding of the Curioi, their long-standing kinship, and the religious and marital religious relations that keep the city going. To origin, desire ends in Christ. To Caraton, it ends in the city's flourishing. Origen's anti-marriage position also offers a striking contrast to the intrusive marriage policies of the Roman imperial administrations. By the third century, moralizing marriage policies were a well-established aspect of Roman hegemony. As pater patriae, father of the fatherland, emperors were expected to involve themselves in the intimate lives of their subjects, a model initiated by the Augustan marriage legislation and maintained well into late antiquity. During Origen's own lifetime, the Emperor Caracalla had granted Roman citizenship to nearly every free citizen living within imperial borders, extending the reach and weight of Roman marital legislation and Roman legislation more generally, more fully into the provinces. A series of rescripts written by the third century emperors or their secretaries and preserved in the Codex of Justinian illustrates the importance of marriage legislation as performances of imperial sovereignty. The emperor, by serving as the ultimate arbiter of household affairs, was enviable to his subjects, sorry, available to his subjects for the upbuilding of marriage practices and property arrangements, and therefore of the empire as well, as these rescripts presuppose. Though busy with the economic mili and military disasters that characterized the third century crisis, the emperors who ruled during Origen's day regularly weighed in on marital disputes affirmed the value of affection, and mediated between fathers and their, un and their married children. Alexander Severus, for example, emperor from 222 until his assassination on the Danube by his own soldiers in 235, advised one Melitia about how to obtain a dowry, helped Maxima resist the opposition of her husband's father to the marriage, and informed a gentleman by the name of Aquila that he could not sue his father's, his wife's father for monies expended during his wife's illness, but he could demand that the father pay for the cost of her funeral from her return dowry. Similarly, in 239, the Emperor Gordian III clarified imperial policy regarding marriage between a provincial woman named um, a provincial woman to a Roman administrator. The children are legitimate if the marriage endures after the husband steps down from his position, Gordian explained to the petitioner Valeria. The same year that Gordian offered this ruling, the Persians attacked Duryarupas, leading the Romans to construct a massive earthen embankment to protect the city, a project which buried the local synagogue, the Christian house church, and a shrine to Mithras, among other buildings. Perhaps Origen's ecclesiae met in similar sorts of house churches in Alexandria or in Caesarea, though none such building survives. In 249, the emperor Decius, responding perhaps to a general sense that the empire was in serious danger and eager to, def in eager to defend a recent adventus in Rome made possible by the army after the murder of the emperor Philip, issued an edict demanding that all the inhabitants of the empire sacrifice to the gods, taste the sacrificial meat, and swear they had always sacrificed, an edict that Christians, not surprisingly, and others refused. As surviving libelli attest, this edict was in fact enforced in many cities, including in Egypt. According to Eusebius, the decree also impacted Christians in Palestine. Alexander, the bishop of Jerusalem, was brought before the governor and was martyred. Origen was tortured, enduring stretching on the rack, humiliation in the stocks, and imprisonment in a dungeon. While Origen was being tortured, Decius was on his way to the Danube to lead the defense of the Roman territory against the Goths. He was also issuing rescripts, as was the custom of the office, including a judgment that permitted a matrona named Urbicana to retain her dowry despite her husband's debts to the state. In 251, Decius was killed on the western frontier, together with most of his army. Meanwhile, in Palestine, Origen succumbed to torture and died. Of course, we cannot know what provoked Origen to devote his life so avidly either to Christian scholarship or to ascetic rigor. According to Eusebius, he was motivated by a Christian zeal he had inherited from his martyr father. But these remarks are colored by the requirements of the genre encomia 
Eusebius's own rhetorical projects, and a historical distance of about 60 years. Still, Origen's surviving intellectual corpus leaves no doubt about his dedication to overcoming what he viewed as the tragic fall of rational souls into heavy material bodies, his intention to find unity with God through Christ, and his determination to apply the best of Greek learning to scriptures he regarded as Christian. His life as a scholar ascetic also gave him enviable access to a world of books, learning, pupils, and patronage, despite his affiliation with a barbaric superstition that led ultimately to his fleshly demise. The pleasures of this kind of life suited him and others like him, perhaps, as together they participated within a broader tradition of foregoing marriage for the purposes of study, student, teacher, and scholar-scholar intimacy, and an ascetic discipline designed to offer liberation for the soul. As Daniel Boy Aron explains, such goals were not unique to Christians. For the blessed few, desire is designed to develop finely into contemplation of the form of beauty itself, a longed-for blessing that goes back at least as far as Plato. From this perspective, the marriage bed can never offer access to the rarefied, more excellent intimacy of the soul with the divine, an ordering desire that Boyarin detects across philosophical, Christian, and rabbinic discourses. The interplay of corporeal versus non-corporeal passions were advanced among circles of educated men who enjoyed a, quote, intensely homoerotic but desexualized male-male spiritual bonding over the seeking of wisdom. The mere physical eros with, of sex with women and procreating children, Boyarn concludes, could never compete with this higher goal. Desire for divine human intimacy and the pursuit of some higher truth in the company of like-minded others advance the social good of friendship and learning, but all too often at the expense of women, who were invited only insofar as they too became male. Though not the primary audience of Origen's homilies and commentaries, it is clear that women were also pursuing spiritual advancement by means of sexual renunciation and the rejection of earthly marriage. The apocryphal acts, as we've already observed, celebrate this fact. The acts are fictions with only tenuous relationships to actual events. Still, they speak to an imaginary under which lies a demonstrable fact. Female sexual renunciants played an active role in defining Christianness, both before and after the advent of Constantine. By the 4th century, John, fifth, fourth and 5th century, John Chrysostom's regular correspondence with Olympias, Jerome's close ties with Paula and Eustochium, Gregory of Nyssa's appreciation for his sister Macrina, the activities of Mel Melania the Elder, Melania the Younger, and Melania's husband Passion, with whom she pursued a chaste marriage of celibate renunciation, the list could go on. All of these women attest to the importance of female ascetics to Christian self-presentation. Close practical and literary collaborations between female and male ascetics advertised in published letter collections and hagiographies celebrated these female saints and their contributions to the goods of the good of their families, the city, and the Christian Roman Empire more broadly. As Chrysostom put it in a homily on Romans, among the ancients, if any are found practicing virginity, it was quite astonishing. But now, virginity is scattered over every part of the world. It is, um, and now in villages and cities, there are hosts of martyrs without number, consisting not only of men, but even of women. A teaching Chrysostom asserted that was anticipated by Paul when he preached the newness of spirit. At least initially, these virgins lived in homes and at home. As Susanna Elm has shown, the earliest monasticism, especially for women, was largely domestic. Women answered the call to celibacy within households, adopting the roles of virgin daughter, virgin widow, and even virgin wife, often with the support of fortunes they controlled and managed. Virgin daughters like Eustochium pursued her vow of celibacy with the, within the monastic household of her mother, the virgin widow Paula, an important patron of Jerome. Similarly, John Chrysostom's close companion and patroness Olympias founded a monastery in her house adjacent to the great church, later Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. Her gubiculare, namely her female slaves, were enrolled as perpetual virgins at the same time. And thus Olympias was able to preserve her su substantial retinue of slaves, even as she and they pursued the life as, of renunciants. As their bishop, 
John offered these women instruction, visiting the, their monastery home often. The virgins ensconced in Olympians' house monastery also likely attended services at the great church, standing near the front of the women's section and listening to the bishop preaching. If so, they provided a striking visual performance of chastity during the liturgies held there. Retinues of virgins dwelling in alternative household monasteries were soon fixtures of the daily life of late anti Christians, and not only in Constantinople. Still, there was one sort of virgin that neither John Chrysostom nor the vast majority of his contemporary bishops were willing to tolerate virgin wives, celebrate women who were cohabitating with celebrate men, not their kin, the infamous sub introducta. The practice of spiritual marriage in which celibate men and celibate women and a celibate woman or women, each of whom is devoted to Christ, live together and assist, assisted one another in their pursuit of divine wisdom may be attested as early as Paul's Corinth. According to Eusebius of Caesarea, the practice attracted its first official rebuke in the late first, third century when Paul of Samosata's custom of living with young women for the sake of shared virginal discipline scandalized the churches of Antioch. Condemned at a synod, synod in 267 to 268, the Antiochenes called these women gunaikes sunesoktoi, women brought into the house to live together with men, or Latin sub introductoi. Both Paul and the practice were heavily censured, despite the synod's acknowledgement that he does nothing licentious. No writings by those who either engaged in or supported Sunesketism sun survive. Nevertheless, as Elizabeth Clark has argued, the attraction of such an arrangement is not difficult to imagine. As we've already observed, the view that women can become men, or at least manly, by means of ascetic rigor was well established. No early Christian writer would deny that the souls of women are capable of ascending into the arms of Christ, and with Christ's help, pursuing manly virtue. Sun Asakatism offered a logical extension to the shared pursuit of manly souls, and in Clark's word, provided a unique opportunity for friendships, which involved a high degree of emotional and spiritual intimacy, a cross-gender form of platonic love. Blake Lyerly offers other possible rationales. The practice was a handy alternative to monastic life, especially when there was no suitable monastery nearby. And spiritual marriage offered the reciprocal benefits of male protection for celibate women and practical assistance for their celibate male hosts. Chris DeWitt finds another less obvious reason for the practice, the demand that renunciants also renounce slaveholding. Living in a household without slaves meant that free ascetics were forced to take on menial tasks themselves and spiritual marriage meant that the tasks associated with each gender could be completed efficiently and spread equally among the members of the household. It was this aspect of Sun Asketism that offended Chrysostom most deeply. Calling the men engaged in the practice women's slaves, Gunai Kodoloi, the bishop shamed them for their slavishly passive service to women, which included <laughs> taking on the roles of oikonomos, household manager, epitropos, overseer or guardian of the women in the household, and a goraios, manager of the women's affairs. Free men ought not to take on such demeaning positions, Chrysostom insisted, since doing so transformed them into womenly men. He employed similarly degrading labels for the sub introducti They are prostitutes, porni, he claimed, since they dare to cohabitate with a man other than their husband, father, or brother. And like female slaves, they make themselves vulnerable to the sexual advances of the men with whom they live. It is better, he concludes, for proper Christian households, those with curios and subordinates, to maintain one or two slaves. Avoiding luxury is a worthy goal. But by sharing slaves, Christian curioi preserve their station, retain a system of surveillance capable of protecting the women in their households, and provide mutual care for fellow slave-owning brothers in Christ. <laughs> In Chrysostom's homilies, the householder ascetic binary has been resolved in such a way that older male, female, and free slave distinctions are upheld and reinforced. Thus, this form of ascetic practice does not so much trouble the social good of hierarchical marriage as confirm it. Preaching to the faithful in Antioch, for example, John reiterated what he took to be standard good Pauline advice. A slave can be taught submission through fear, but even he, if provoked too much, 
will soon seek his escape. Yet a wife, the mother of one's children, should never be fettered with fear and threats, but with love and patience. What kind of marriage can there be when the wife is afraid of her husband? What sort of satisfaction could a husband himself have if he lives with his wife as if she were a slave? From this perspective, marriage is a partnership of near equals, and the superior party, the man, should not need to beat his wife to prove it. Fourth century Christians, bishops like John, therefore maintained a civic Christian good by encouraging householding male curioi to uphold relations of domination and submission capable of charting human fleshy bodies ontologically and practically, while the entire church waited for eternal life to come. Desire's good was apportioned across monasteries, including those that had once been household, desert habitations transformed into wildernesses of miraculous spiritual discipline, and bishop ascetics, each of whom witnessed to the eternal life to come, but without troubling older views of life as it is. Writing in 2002, in advance of the decision by the United States Supreme Court that the 14th Amendment requires all states to grant and recognize same-sex marriages, Judith Butler asked why such recognition is sought at all, not only by same-sex couples, but by couples more generally. In the context of the law, marriage becomes a means by which, quote, desire and sexuality are ratified, justified, known, publicly instated, and imagined as permanent, durable. In the process, personal desire acquires a certain anonymity and interchangeability, becomes, as it were, publicly mediated, and in that sense, a kind of legitimated public sex. Legitimated public sex can be good for those with access to it. Melitia, for example, was able to obtain a dowry. Valeria had her children recognized as legitimate, and Urbacana was not forced to pay her husband's debts. Others, however, do not have access to, rec to such recognitions. Prior to the reversal of, a policy, of the policy by the Emperor Septimius Severus, for example, no Roman soldier could marry. Any children he fathered were illegitimate, and any provincial woman he impregnated had no avenue of redress if she was abandoned. As a rule, slaves never had access to legal marriage, as Olympias' example and Chrysostom's words further illustrate. Yet as funerary stella, inscriptions, and even imperial rescripts indicate, such laws did not and do not govern the paths desire takes or the bonds that desire can form. Soldier provincial marriages, slave slave, slave master, and slave freedman marriages may not have been legally recognized, but they clearly took place. The Christian sub introducti phenomenon highlights another gap between law and the diversity of the kinds of partnerships human beings form. Apparently, celibate men were not the only group interested in forming relationships based in a, an asexual quest for meaning, maleness, and a divine embrace. Marriage, as an intimate partnership through which good can be sought, exceeds marriage, the publicly recognized and recognizable institution through which bodies are sorted, organized, and granted political as well as ontological status. The marriage metaphor so important to the theological speculation of Jesus' followers and later Christians seems to me to do a better job at recognizing the obvious gap between what human beings have wanted and what legal marriages have been able to achieve. Once the emperor gets involved, I start to worry. Yet an orienting desire for an intimate connection with one another, especially with one particular other, can and does open pathways that lead us where we want to go. Without desire, there is no way forward and no path to find. The fact of marriage produced the dream of human divine marriage and a generative way of imagining what unity with the divine might be like. Marriage metaphors, however, have neither made nor unmade the very real implications of that institution for those for, from whom such a gesture of return is expected, nor have they compensated those who are denied access to this privileged, legitimated public sex. The happiest day of your life may well be your wedding day. I hope it is, but it may not be. Partnership along the way, however, that is truly a blessing. And if one is very lucky, a marriage partner can be an intimate other 
with whom a way forward can be found. The early Christian axiology of difference, based in a householder ascetic binary, charted a way forward for Origen and Chrysostom, albeit in strikingly different ways. If the goal, however, is apokatastasis, then corporate study, close collaboration, and creative reimagining of many possible futures, some of which include marriage and some of which do not, must not be neglected, as this conference demonstrates, and splendidly. Thank you. Jennifer, yeah, she's happy to take some questions here from the audience. The floor is open. Um, I, I want to thank you for this incredibly rich paper, and thank you for the thought you gave me, which is that um, uh, in the Latin West, Augustine, this, this model of civic good, uh -huh. when he discusses the raised body and soul uh -huh. Uh -huh. in the city of God, yes. The soul and the body cling to each other and were meant to cling to each other to be true marriage partners. Uh, which is a, a beautiful yes. image of the individual as as the two ontological parts being being truly wed. Yes. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that too. I told Professor Fredrickson there was no way I was talking about Augustine in front of her. <laughs> <laughs> I do love that. I do love the marriage metaphor. I have to say, the way that the church fathers really work with it and think about it as a way of talking about this this deep connection that is nevertheless there are still two different parts and yet and yet they're blended. It's really beautiful what they do with that. Yes, yes, yes. Can you discern some change in ethics towards marriage? I mean, re rehabilitation, going yeah. back to early models, etc. Well, I think that, um, I mean, as I said at the beginning, there's this kind of legacy of these, this anti marriage stance, which Professor Fredrickson has argued goes right back to Jesus, and which I am persuaded by her point of view, right? Um, and that we can certainly find in Paul. Um, the Apostle Paul's writings. So then what are you going to do with that? You know, because of obviously this is Christian scripture and this is the holy book, and so you know, it doesn't go away. And it, it seems to me sort of charting the difference between Origen and John Chrysostom's response already shows that there has to be rethinking all along the way. So whereas Origen, in my reading anyway, is not very concerned about households, you know? And why would he be? I mean, he's living at a moment when he's gonna to be tortured to death, right? So building households, having children, if one is a Christian at that period, doesn't seem to be the sort of motivating <laughs> factor, right? But of course, John Chrysostom's living in a very different world where Christians are benefiting, benefiting from imperial patronage and in fact claiming <coughs> the very um, ecclesiae that they had rejected, at least implicitly, by calling their gatherings assemblies to begin with. Um, so I guess my answer to your question is the great thing about sacred scripture is it can always be reinterpreted. <laughs> Any further questions? Well, everything is set. Now no. they're going to be taking your path. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Oh, Etienne, yeah. please. No, um, I was struck by the fact that you um, uh, introduced this question mainly from the anti-marriage stance. Yeah. But um, at the same time, it's part of the Christian tradition, yeah. and, and some can trace it back to Jesus, the fact yeah. that marriage becomes definitive yes. and it takes an absolute value. Yes. So would you put yeah. these as para a paradox, mm -hmm. or does it go together in a certain way? I think it can go together. Um, I, I chose, I, I went with the sexual renunciate question because I was struck by this idea that I got from Sarah Ahmed about desire social good and the way in which marriage function has fun functioned 
in that way, which then made the anti-marriage stance seem even weirder. And so I was trying to understand what that was about and why that was attractive beyond the eschatology part, which you know makes a certain kind of sense. It's a great historical explanation, but even as the eschatology part sort of fades, it still remains a very important part of the Christian tradition, I think, going forward. Um, but I think that you're right, and I've you know written elsewhere about there's a way of there's a theology of, of marriage also that you know can fit with the marriage metaphor in a really strong way, so that we can think about you know the marriage relationship and um, as being a sort of generative uh, partic participation in um, angelic life going forward, and depending on you know who we read, we can we can find that kind of argument, that kind of explanation being made. Chrysostom has his own kind of theology of marriage that that um, supports marriage very strongly as a kind of theological choice, um, in which intimacy with the married partner, you know, chaste intimacy, right? Not everything goes, but chaste intimacy within the context of marriage is a kind of practice for eternal life. Um, I didn't talk about that because I could have, but you know the paper was already darn long enough, and I had somehow gotten stuck in my own questioning around this rejection of marriage position, um, which was very strange, actually, <laughs> in the first century, as much as it does fit a kind of model of scholar, um, scholar, teacher, student, you know, we're looking at the good and therefore we don't have time for that kind of tradition, especially within Greek thought. Yeah, Paula. I just, um, you're provoking all these uh, <laughs> ideas. Um, there's a story that Gregory of Tours tells mm -hmm. of the bishop and his wife who died at almost the same time. Mm -hmm. And one sarcophagus is put against one side of the chapel and the other is put against the other side of the chapel. And yes. then the next day when people walk in, Magically, the two uh -huh. coffins are next to each other, uh -huh. so that they're lying next to each other yes. as they have throughout the Okay, marriage, that's beautiful. Marriage. And so there's something yeah. about the bond, yes. which is, is stronger than, or it's beyond, it, it transcends the physical, that, that yes. is the marriage bond itself. Well, and that re res resonates with me with some of the fact that you know, certain people were not permitted to be married legally but understood themselves to be married. So you see these on funerals, you know, funerary stella where you'll see slaves who, where they erect a funerary monument to their, to their deceased spouse. So, so what is said about marriage and the kinds of affective bonds, affective, you know, emotional bonds that hold people together don't necessarily track, right? That uh, marriage, because it's a social fact, and it's not practiced the same way, marriage law, marriage practices change all the time, but, but um, those kinds of dis discourses do not actually capture the kinds of effective bonds that people make with one another. I mean, I think we know that from our own lives, right? That, that somehow, you know, the public discourse around marriage and the kinds of deep connections people form don't always um, match. Oh, Gabriel, I guess please. first just a comment to build up on that and then mm -hmm. a question. Um, the whole aspect of marriages that aren't legally possible yeah. uh, comes up in, um, I believe yeah. it's Antipope Hippolytus. Yeah. One of the accusations he levels against Pope Calixtus is precisely that Calixtus is permitting marriages that aren't actually legal. Uh -huh. So almost as though there's this huh. at least uh -huh. local Roman ecclesiastical recognition that uh -huh. there is something akin to marriage and allowing it to exist as such, uh -huh. even though it's not legally married. Uh -huh. So it's that, that's the earliest text I know where we start to see this uh -huh. concrete Christian distinction between something that, at least in some minds, is a type of marriage that's not equal to what is marriage according to right. the legal definition. Um, and then the sort of, so I you know, uh -huh. can comment on that. And then the question uh -huh. is, since you brought up uh, the other aspect of Chris's time. I yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I apologize for probing you on that. Yeah, yeah. It's not yeah. a part of your paper. But I'm just curious, you know, I think it's in his, is it the 12th homily on Corinthians, where he talked precisely on that point. He yes. just referenced the, yes. that the sexually active married couple can achieve, the, can rival the holiness yes. of monks. Yes. 
have you detected that in any of that? Such a strong affirmation yeah. earlier in the first system? I mean, nothing comes to mind, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing out there, right? <laughs> so I mean, I mean, maybe I haven't dug deep enough yet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Chris Austin's so interesting because of, you know, he's a pastor to married people. That's his main job, right? So he's not going to go in like Origin and be like, well, you know, Lot's daughters. You know what I mean? Can you imagine? So he, has to, he cares for their souls deeply. And I think he comes up with a really compelling theological explanation for what they're doing and, and encouragement of them. Um, that, I don't know. I have to think about that some more. Um, I, I haven't come across anything exactly like that. But I do find the sub introductory case like super interesting because like, what's the big deal, folks? Right? You know, you, you said that chastity's you know celibate cha in this sense ch celibacy as chastity is good. You know, you have these like crazy stories in the apocryphal Acts. You've got all these you know wives not sleeping with their husbands, and their hu and, the, and the husbands are like, oh, good point. Let's not do that. You know, and those stories were tremendously popular. So what's the problem? And the only explanation I can really come up with is that it, it has something to do with the importance of distinguishing what households do from what ascetics do as a way of maintaining theories of difference that were active and deeply important in a kind of um, you know, cosmological universal sense to um, ancient Greek people. Um, different binaries than our own, which is also interesting. Okay, thank you very much. You have really launched it.